Okay, aloha everyone. Let's see. Um, we are so excited to be able to present today and and um, Cameron and I both feel like it's an honor to be able to um, speak directly to our community as well as our community supporters and advocates and um, take place in this important work as it has impacted us uh, very personally and um, deeply. And so we hope to have a lot of um, meaningful um, conversation today. So I guess we can uh, jump right in and I'm gonna do a screen share. Um, so thank you so much for the warm introduction. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I'm gonna allow um, Cameron to introduce himself. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Cameron He. Um, I'm a PhD student here at BYU's Marriage and Family Therapy Program. Um, that's where I got my master's too. And I'm originally from Kalawa, um, which is just north of Kona on Hawaii Island or the big island of Hawaii. And I'm excited to be here with you all this morning. Great. So today uh, we are going to be talking about some challenging issues around white fragility, racism, oppression, and privilege. And our goal for this presentation is to have a meaningful dialogue around racial inequalities as they affect all of us, um, not just here, but everyone in our society. And hopefully we can, uh, our hopes are that we can work together to make things better for our Pacific Island communities. Um, we today are going to have some interaction um, and, dis and discussion based presentation where learning and growth and change can take place. Uh, we will be having a breakout session that it, we will be able to exchange ideas. And in order to make this a safe place, we'd like to set some conversation guardrails so that everyone can feel confident that they will not be exposed to discrimination, criticism, harassment, or any kind of emotional harm. So in order to do those, um, to set up that environment, we'd like to, we have a couple reminders for, first of all, for everyone to be respectful of others' thoughts and emotions and also to use I language, speaking from your own experience and, and avoiding using language um, that speaks on behalf of others or uses terms like they and them. And um, finally, we like to remind you to please um, don't assume that we know what others' intentions are and that we would keep what we are saying in this meeting confidential. We are also going to be doing a phone poll, so you should be able to see the instructions on here. Um, I'd like to take a minute um, for, to set this up, and this is something that everyone can participate from, um, from your phones, wherever you are. So we'd like you to use your, your phone. You can also use a computer browser if you'd like um, to make sure you go to pollev.com on your computer browser. And if you're just on your regular phone, just go ahead and put pollev.com. And it will prompt you for a username. The username is my name, uh, Cynthia Wong, C Y N T H I A Wong, W O N G, 098, because 801 was already taken for some reason. Um, this is 098. And um, you can choose, you don't have to put in your actual name or your username. You can go ahead and, and skip so that you can participate anonymously if you feel comfortable. So give everyone maybe a couple minutes, uh, maybe 30 seconds to, to log on and then we'll be able to do um, some polls throughout this, this discussion. So um, for our first question, um, this is more of a reflection question that we'd like you guys to think about on your own is, is how you define racism. And um, you're welcome to participate in the chat um, for during our session at any time. If you have any comments, um, you're welcome to put those. But I'd like you to think about how you define racism and whether or not it includes any of these elements. So does your definition um, include simple, isolated, extreme acts of prejudice? Does your definition include um, intention, a degree of maliciousness or harm? And does it um, also include any kind of prejudice based on the conscious dislike of someone because of their race? 
So one of the things is that we know in defining racism, if we were together in like a room and we asked you guys, okay, come up with a collective definition of racism, it would be really hard to define because everyone has like different, different views of what that looks like. And so I'm gonna break them down one by one um, to show that maybe racism is not what we necessarily think. So in terms of the simple, isolated and extreme acts of prejudice, although racist acts do occur, these acts are more part of a larger system of interlocking dynamics. But focusing on individual incidents just masks the personal, interpersonal, cultural, historical and structural um, layers of a larger system. In terms of intention, um, there's, there's a quote that I like to use that Sometimes um, people say, oh, I didn't mean to offend you. You know, it wasn't my intention. Just wanted to point out that even intentions, even though they may be good, they do have impact that can be harmful. And so intention is not actually a, prerequis a prerequisite of racism. Um, so when we understand that um, racism is a system of structured relations in which we're all socialized, we understand that intentions are relevant. So like when we understand how socialization works, um, racial bias, is, a lot of that is unconscious. So, so that takes out the intention part. And then finally, um, disliking someone because of race or color, um, you know, we can be told by our parents, like, you know, don't, don't, don't harm other people, don't tell racist jokes, but yet we are still, we're still affected by forces of racism, whether we actively participate or not, because we are a member of a society in which racism is a bedrock. So um, what we'd like you to do now for our first phone poll is think about some images or terms that you associate with racism. And that, um, that question, um, just like to put a shout out to Daniel on the tech end who's helping us with the, these polls um, and is activating them as, as we speak so that we can see the results live. So the question is what images or terms do you associate with racism? And as we uh, you start to put in your answers, we should see a, uh, a live results of the poll. So great, we're starting to see some of those pop up. And I'm just looking on a, a second screen here. So we've got, um, and you'll notice that the bigger the words, um, the more people have agreed that this is a, def a definition of racism. So, so far we're seeing um, violence, prejudice, oppression, hate, white, that's an interesting word to put in there, marginalized, hierarchy, We have mistreatment. <coughs> Supremacy, ignorance, oppression. Thank you for participating. Keep, you can keep, um, keep participating in this question or adding to this question. We have brutality, especially what's happening um, just most recently in our, uh, to our brothers and sisters in Minnesota. So as we start to generate these, um, these terms, and also usually they're associated with images as well. So when I think about racism, I think about kind of the, the definitions um, like, um, like white supremacy that comes with an image in my mind, you know, um, it comes with mistreatment of um, traditionally marginalized people, especially black people. And so, um, the reason why these are important is because these, what we call archetypes of racism, make it difficult for us to talk about it. So, for example, um, we have another um, another breakout discussion, and this is going to be our first one um, for today, and it's also related to a poll. So, this kind of has two steps to it. The first thing we'd like you to, to um, answer on the poll is simple yes or no question. And thank you again for Daniel for activating this. The question is, are you racist? Yes or no? 
Okay, so I'd like you to reflect on that and then go ahead and respond. Are you racist? Yes or no? And then what we're going to do is put you in um, breakout rooms. So everyone who's here. Now, if you are watching live from um, the hotel in Salt Lake City, that will be your breakout room. So the people around you are going to be your group. And we're going to give you about five minutes to explain how you responded to the poll and also an explanation of why you, you responded in that way. So um, we are um, going to put you in the breakout rooms now. And um, we will see you in about five minutes. OK, welcome back, everyone. Um, thank you for participating. Cameron and I got to uh, go to one of some of the other groups and found some really fascinating discussion. So let's let's talk about it a little bit more and, and break it down. Um, so let's go to our poll results first. So. Um, well, this is a little surprising than what we saw, what we were thinking. So we have, um, and you're still welcome to um, participate in the poll, but we have, looks like 61% who are saying uh, yes, 63% saying yes, they're racist, and, um, and no saying 37%. So um, we'd like to have a little bit of a, a group discussion around this. Um, in my group, we had some really great comments, and I shared personally how um, this was a hard question for a lot of reasons, and we'll talk about like why asking are you racist, yes or no, putting it in those terms as a binary is already problem problematic, but it wasn't, um, when I went to graduate school, I went to the University of Southern California, and when I was there, I thought, um, I took a multicultural um, education class, and I thought before that brown people could not be racist. Um, I thought, oh, racism is something that happens to us. Racism is something that is inflicted upon, upon us. Um, but I myself am not racist because I'm brown and I can, um, I can empathize with uh, other people of color because that's something in our shared experiences. But I realized you know, that that was, that was not necessarily true, that for me myself, it was really, really hard to kind of like a hard pill to swallow to say, you know what, let's, if I, if I really examine this and if I'm truthful, there are things that um, would, would uh, qualify as, as racist. And um, so other things like in our in our discussion, I, um, and I, there is some uh, comments about we know why it's hard to maybe admit that we are, we might be racist is because we know that it's wrong and it's hard to associate with ourselves that with something that is wrong. Um, are there any other comments? We'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to um, unmute your microphone for a minute. We'll just maybe talk for two minutes or so and discuss if anyone has something that they learned from this activity or they learn from this, um, their discussion. And um, we'd love to hear if anyone um, has any comments. So I'm, I'm seeing um, Andrea Hernandez. Love to hear from you. Hi, Cynthia. Good morning, everyone. So I did talk in, and share in my group that um, and it's funny because I'm also coming from California. So the way that I interpreted race and racism um, is different. I thought growing up that everyone was racist um, or everyone can practice racism or racist tendencies. However, when I went to college, I learned that that was different um, because the concept of race is a very uh, westernized notion and it was created by white people. Um, and so with that being said, um, when I think of race and a racist structure, I see it to the benefit of white people and white community. And so for um, that fact, I, I don't, I'm not a white member. And so I don't benefit in as in race or racism in that particular way. However, that does not mean that I am not um, or that I am immune to practicing racial tendencies or having biases or unconscious biases or practicing discrimination. That's something that is, is a, one of my flaws as a human being. And so I'm constantly working in um, trying to abolish those tendencies and better understanding of what those things in 
things are. Um, but in regards to the question, are you a racist? And in regards to racism being a structure, a hierarchical structure, I do not benefit from that. And so that's why I put no. However, I am conscious that I do have to work on my own uh, thoughts around discrimination um, and non-inclusiveness. Andrea, thank you for sharing that. I, I'm hearing you say that, you know, as race as a social construct is something that um, is maybe a white, a white um, comes from um, background of, of white uh, privilege as well. And that it's um, under that you're not accepting that as a label. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Lillian and then Paul. Thank you. Uh, I'm coming from Hilo, Hawaii, and um, I was born uh, in, I mean, I was born while Hawaii was still in the state of a territory. And so even the word racist is very alien. The, you know, the, the, what became very evident uh, when President Trump was um, our president was the degree of hate. Um, and um, I certainly don't feel that in those terms, I'm racist. And I do agree with Andrea that it is um, a definition that was um, provided or created by those who are in power. So I, uh, I'm very aware as growing up in Hawaii as a, in a territory that there are people who have a lot of power. And I am not uh, a colonizer. So or the people that I associate with my family. And because we're, there's so many of us that have so many types of ethnicity, it's difficult to, um, uh, you know, you're really trying to identify. So I'm Hawaiian, Chinese, Tahitian, Portuguese, English, and mm. it, it, it just doesn't seem, I mean, it's just a difficult construct to wrap your head around or to fit yourself in it. Because it's very, it appears to be this question is a very simplistic box that I don't find myself in it. So I'm going to say that's why I, I say no, no, I'm not racist. Okay, thank thank you for sharing that, Auntie Lillian, and also for talking about the different intersections um, of of cultural identity and. Um, and later today, um, Cameron is going to be talking about how those uh, experiences of oppression and colonization um, do affect us today, like with our mental health and even our identity of how, how we relate to others. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, Paul, I'd love to hear from you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Paul. I'm coming in from Los Angeles. And... I take a whole different view on this. I think all of us have racism in us in, in one form or another, whether we're racist against this religion, whether we're racist against this, there's a form of discrimination. What I don't want to do, and and, and forgive me if I, if I sound like the word detest me, I, I'm, I detest the word because I think it's a, it's a category and a grouping that we allow ourselves to fit under. I don't ever want to feel like the white man this, the white man that, I think it's hogwash, throw it out the window. We are powerful people. When we start comparing ourselves to other people, that's when we start getting into the he said, she said, or woe is me syndrome. I absolutely detest it because I detest it in the sense that as a people, as we as a people, if we know who we are as a people, we have the power. Us allowing other people to, to take that power away from us, that, that's us allowing them to take it. We still have our own powers. Yes, we live under their construct. Yes, we live under their rules. Yes, we live under some of the things that they have changed, but it doesn't take away who we are as an identi identifying as a people. I am a strong Pacific Islander person. I am a person of mana. I am somebody from the kingdom of Tonga. We were the colonizers of the Pacific. Um, but I don't say that to say that Tonga is better than this. I say that because when I'm empowered, when I wake up every day, I'm the child of the almighty high. Nobody's going to take that joy from me. And I don't allow titles or names that define me because I think it's silly. My strength comes in knowing that I can do what I can do as a human. I don't want to be called this or that or this or that. I'm a human. We're all on this earth as one. We're, we're part of the human race. 
when we start allowing us to be labeled or when we start allowing ourselves to be put into categories, I think that's when we start feeling like, oh, well, that group has more attention than my group. Don't look at it that way. At least that's the way I, that's the way I approach things. I approach things looking at it as how can I as a person be the best me in this space? I'm only given one life on this earth. I'm going to make this life count. And if I'm going to spend my time worrying about what I don't have and the woe is me syndrome and, oh, I didn't get this because I didn't get that. Well, go out and do it. Do it. We have the power to do these things, people. And and it, 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 it amazes me the amount. Again, this is no disrespect to anyone here and their idea of what I just I just feel as 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 a human. We have the power to be who we are because of who we are not because somebody says that's what we are. And the minute we start allowing people to put labels on us, the minute we start allowing others to define who we are as a people, that's when I believe we're in trouble. Thank you for sharing that, that Paul. I can definitely um, feel, you know, the, the mana behind your statement and your sentiments. And um, as this is, a, you know, quite a, a difficult topic to, to grapple with as we think about our, our own identities and our own um, ability to navigate these systems of racism that I don't think any of us can deny that it, it exists, you know. Um, and but having um, having that in mind, um, we're going to kind of tailor this. Our next section is in talking about um, white people's um, experiences with racism and how sometimes saying, well, um, that, you know, this uh, racism doesn't exist or racism. Um, it's up to the individuals to de to determine um, their own destinies. Sometimes um, that in, that is difficult to do within the system that we 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 live in. But um, um, we, you know, we but become we become racist the minute we say white people. We're becoming a racist by saying white people. And well, with this, um, so yeah, maybe Hoku, if it's okay. Um, I'd love to transition to the next slides is, um, or Hoku, would you love to add something to this discussion? Because I'm, I'm also, um, the way that we pose this question, are you racist? Yes or no, for, forcing it into this binary is problematic. And that's why it was kind of, um, we started a discussion like with this. And as we continue, it's gonna, we're gonna say why even using this label, using this term um, is, is problematic in, in this larger discussion. So. Um, yeah, so thank you for sharing that, everyone. Um, Hoku, I just wanted to, sorry, I didn't want to cut you off, but do you like to um, comment or uh, just? Sure, um, maybe just yeah. briefly, and, and I'll apologize in advance because I have a, a 10 o'clock meeting I have to, to, to get to, but um, uh, it, with this question and, and I, have similar reactions, I think, you know, it's, it's hard for me to acknowledge, especially since I, as I read this question, I think of, is this who I am? Is this sort of how I see myself? And that, that's a hard pill to swallow. Also, because I, I, I don't like to think of this as, as how I am. At the same time, I feel like it's really important to acknowledge that I have racial bias, right? I, I believe that, that that's just part of our experience. I think it's part of the systems that we live in. And and I can have examples of, you know, instances, and, and I, I believe so much of this <clears throat> exists on an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. And it would be so important to me to know that people who benefit most from these systemic structures are willing to acknowledge this. And at the same time, it wouldn't feel fair or right to me to hope and expect others to do that if I'm not willing to do that myself. Mm -hmm. And um, and and certainly, I don't feel like I benefit in the same ways as a lot of um, different people or groups do, but I do benefit in many ways. You know, as as a male, I benefit in a lot of different spaces that I live and work in, and um, and also even in regard to my complexion. My wife is from Fiji; she has a darker complexion than me, and her experience is very different than mine. Mm -hmm. And um, and so, you know, there there are many aspects in which I, I might benefit. Or, or not benefit in the same way. Um, but I feel it's important to me to acknowledge. Okay, thank you for sharing that, Hoku. I appreciate your um, perspectives on that. Um, 
And then uh, let's see, we have one more comment from uh, Kavika, and then um, we'd love to hear from Kavika before we move to the next slides. Thank you so much, everyone. We are um, we are actually also monitoring the chat here. So thank you so much for the discussions that are going on um, alongside our live discussion. We feel these are valuable things to be bringing up as well. So feel free to keep participating as, as we continue the discussion. And then uh, Kavika. Yeah, so I, I, just a real quick comment. Thank you, uh, Cynthia, for um, really holding this very, very difficult dialogue. Right, this very important uh, discussion that we're having, and I, I resonated with the with uh, uh, Paul's manna. Uh, I connected to to his manna and 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 what he was saying about identity and who we are. While at the same time, I also connected to what Hoka was saying about there are certain privileges and certain things that are already uh, structures that are. Um, power structures that are in place that uh, sometimes have to be addressed and reconciled. And if folks are not reconciling that where there's um, uh, a lack of equity across different peoples, then voices are important, right? And so, but but it's a difficult situation and, and it's complicated and there's not, not just one answer to this. And, and I feel very connected to what's happening now that that I'm recognizing that we have this space, uh, hopefully a space, a safe space and, and a brave space to be able to share and talk about these things among our people because uh, when do we ever talk about these things? And when do we ever talk about these difficult dialogues and in, su in such an open forum? And so uh, I just appreciate the opportunities from hearing from Paul and Hoku and other, others, uh, others and other perspectives and try to build bridges and, and try to connect and understand each other. And so I appreciate what has been said already. Thank you, Cynthia. And thank you for everyone who has uh, shared their voice to this. Um, and we hope that this discussion will continue actually past, um, past this presentation as we go throughout the weekend to um, still engage in, in these really uh, complex discussions over, over racism and oppression and um, how it affects us. So I'm gonna jump to um, our next slide um, and we're gonna kind of talk about white fragility. Um, white fragility is uh, a term that's coined by Robin D'Angelo. And she said that white fragility is characterized by em emotions such as um, anger, fear and guilt and by behaviors such as argumentation and silence. And these are reactions to, to racism. Um, when, when someone is called as, you know, even when we use the term, like, are you racist? Um, that, like, how many of you guys were offended by that? Like, oh, racist, how can, that's, that's a very loaded term, right? And so this white fragility is kind of the reactions to, um, to racism and that happen. And these, the, the white fragility, it, it is a function of reinstating um, equilibrium to prevent meaningful cross-racial dialogue. So it's these def um, defensive um, emotions, reactions, and, and behaviors are really meant to kind of uh, maintain the white power structure. So how that works is we talked a little bit about the architect types of racism and the terms that we come to associate with it, The um, also the images that we come to associate with it. and. Um, D'Angelo says that prior to the civil rights movement, it was socially acceptable for people to proclaim their racial superiority. However, when um, Northerners in the United States saw violence against Black people, they were appalled. They started to see these images of white Southerners who were smiling and having picnics at the bases of the lynching trees, beating Black people, women and children, burning churches. It kind of led to this archetype about what racism actually looks like and and um it we we might think that like okay making racism and labeling it as like a bad thing is a step forward but you know in a way it's also problematic because it creates two false dichotomies that takes us from really address that prevents us from really like addressing racism so the first one the first dichotomy is um, whether or not you are racist or not racist. And we, we talked about why this is a difficult discussion, right? Just putting it in those two terms, yes or no, black or white, racist or not racist is problematic. The second is the second dichotomy is that racist people are bad and non-racist people are good. So, so what happens when there are only two options of either being racist or, or not racist? And D'Angelo says that Within this paradigm, to suggest that I am racist is to 
is to de deliver a deep moral blow, kind of character assassination. Having received this blow, I must defend my character and that is where all my energy will go to deflecting the charge rather than reflecting on my behavior. And in this way, the good bad binary makes it impossible to talk about, to, to talk to white people about racism, what it is and how it shapes all of us and the ways that we are conditioned to participate in it. Because if we cannot discuss these dynamics or see ourselves within them, then we, we cannot stop participating in racism. So basically, it, this binary makes it effectively impossible for the average white person to understand, much less interrupt racism. So I think about um, like recent examples in the media was Prince William, um, he was asked, um, you know, during, he was asked by a reporter, are you a racist family? And, and of course, the automatic um, response was, oh, we are not a racist family. And um, the royal family is not a racist family. But because of that, that response, it makes it impossible for him to be able to reflect on, on the deeper issues of racism in, in, um, and how they interact with it in their lives. So um, there are um, kind of two responses that are protective that white people tell themselves to, um, to avoid being labeled as racist. And the first one is called colorblindness. Um, some of the statements that we might hear people say is like, oh, I was, I was taught to treat everyone the same, or I don't see color. Um, I don't care, I hear this one a lot. I don't care if you're pink or purple or striped or polka dot, everyone's the same. Race doesn't matter. Um, if people respect me, I respect them regardless of race. So one of the structural advantages of whiteness is that the phrase race doesn't matter can only be true for a white person. And as a white, like a white person, there are no meaningful threats to their physical, emotional, or professional status by simply existing in the United States. However, this is not true for people of color who cannot avoid racist racism. Um, so indeed, we generally place the burden of like combating racism on people of color. But D'Angelo demonstrates that white fragility, this defense mechanism is to kind of deny that race matters and to erase the lived experiences of people of color. Another one of the, um, the responses that white people use to avoid being associated with racism or being called racist is, um, I don't know if you've heard any of these, but like, oh, I live in a neighborhood with uh, lots of brown people. Um, I have people of color in my family. I served an LDS mission in Ponga. Um, I was a minority when I lived in Hawaii. I served in the Peace Corps. Um, I was, you know, all of these statements kind of to suggest, well, does that make you any less racist? Um, or does it, does it reduce the racism if you can associate with other people of color? So again, these, these things about, um, what, about white fragility is, um, is really, it, it evokes naturally this very defensive reaction to deflect the charge rather than reflect on behavior. Other types of reactions um, to being called racist are people feeling singled out, feeling attacked, silenced, shamed, guilted, um, insulted, angry, scared, outraged, defensive. Like if you think about in your circles, um, when these difficult conversations about race has, have come up, how did, how did the people who are white in those circles, how did they react? Did they have any of these, these reactions to white fragility and, or to racism and what happened as a result of those reactions? The next ones are these behaviors. So in addition to um, like feeling defensive, um, there is, um, um, denial, argumentation, avoidance, silence, emotional withdrawal, um, focusing on intention like, oh, I, I've heard this actually in the last couple of weeks from someone um, in a discussion, oh, I'm, I didn't mean to offend anyone. And, um, and if you took that by, you know, if you took that in the wrong way, I didn't mean it. Um, and I'm sorry that you're offended. Okay, those reactions right there are, are examples of like white fragility. And even the term white fragility, like the, sometimes we associate the word fragility with weakness, right? Um, but uh, white fragility is not actually weakness in the way that D'Angelo defines it. She's, she says, think of it as weaponized weakness, weaponized fears, 
weaponized hurt feelings. The impact is not weak at all. It's a powerful means of white racial control. So just kind of in summary, the, the functions of white fragility are to, um, this is a racial, um, it's meant to maintain racial power, maintain white solidarity, close off reflection, trivialize like the realities of racism, silence the discussion, um, even hijacking the discussion at times, protecting the limited worldview, taking race, race off the table and really to protect this white privilege. Um, we also have white fragility. These are some rules of engagement. We call them rules of engagement because there are like these kind of like unspoken, this tacit agreement, like, okay, if you're gonna talk to me about race, you have to follow my rules. So this is from a, a white person is like, okay, in order to talk about this very difficult topic, you cannot, um, you cannot bring this up in a public setting. You must give it to me privately. You have to um, focus on intentions. The tone that you use is crucial. These these uh, rules of engagement are not um, they're not they're not written down, right? They're not um, like here's how we have a discussion on racism. But these are very like unspoken, like silent rules um, that that are imposed on people who bring this up in, in confronting their racism. So if you think about um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna show you a video clip so that you can see examples of white fragility. And we want you to see how many you can identify. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background about this clip. Um, the person on the left that you see is named Sharon Osborne, and she is a wife of Ozzy Osborne. Um, she comes from the UK, and then on the right, um, you see Cheryl Underwood, and they are both hosts of a TV show called The Talk. Um, in this clip, Sharon Osborne is uh, protecting one of her her friends named Pierce Morgan, who was recently fired because he um, were, there were allegations of racism um, when he. In, in the recent media. And so she's kind of defending him. Now, we know that sometimes um, on Zoom, there is a little bit of delay. You might notice a delay in um, some of the audio in this video clip. That's because there's a whole bunch of bad words that Susan or that Sharon says. And so those were blanked out by the studio. You're, nothing was wrong with your audio. But um, if for some reason this audio is not coming through, we're also putting the links to this video in the chat. So you can watch this on your own um, and you can watch this um, um, either before or after this presentation, or you can do it now if the audio doesn't come through. So I'm gonna go ahead and play, and then we're gonna um, kind of talk about that. I um I I feel even mm -hmm. like uh, I'm about to be put in the electric chair because I have a friend who many people think is a racist, so that makes me a racist. And for me, at 68 years of age, to have to turn around and say I ain't racist, right. what's well, it got to do with me? Well, I'm okay, well, how can I be racist about anybody? How can I be racist about anybody or anything in my life. How can I? Well, 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 well what? You, we will be right well, back. What? We have more topics, so don't go away. And I think we don't should go. stop this. I will From ask you again, Cheryl. Yes. I've been asking you during the break. Right. I'm asking you again. And don't try and cry, because if anyone should be crying, it should be me. This is the situation. Yeah. You tell me where you have heard him say, educate me, tell me when you have heard him say racist things. E educate me, tell me. It, it is not the exact words of racism. It's the implication and the reaction to it, to not want to address that because she is a black woman and to try to dismiss it or to make it seem less than what it is, that's what makes it racist. But, but right now, I'm talking to a woman who I believe is my friend. And I don't want anybody here to, to
to l watch this and say that we're attacking you for being racist. And, oh. and, and, that, and, and for that, <laughs> if I articulate it... I think it's anything, too late. I think that okay. seed's already sown. But that, that is why I'm <laughs> saying for me, I'm saying for me, for me, I thought I was asking a question about uh, the perception for other people. That's why I prefaced it with, I've never heard you utter anything oh, racist, Cheryl, but, I have, but I have felt that Pierce was racist in his stance against Meghan Markle. And the last time he was on this show, I said as much. I said it when he was on this and show. And what was his answer to you? So before we get on to um, the, the second part with Cameron, um, what kind of examples of white fragility did you see in that last video clip? I'm not sure if it came through clearly. I think it, I suspect it might have been choppy, but did anyone pick up on um, how uh, um, Sharon used some of the uh, different things of white fragility to defend herself? Feel free to um, un unmute. Um, Bella. I, I, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. You can go ahead. I'll go after. No, no, I'm go ahead, Bella. Okay. I think one of the ways was, um, you know, her expect uh, what she said at the very beginning, how she felt like she uh, was put, you know, going to be put in an electric chair because she wanted to, to defend her friend. Um, and so just that, you know, even ha just having the conversation. Uh, and having that uh, like fear of uh, like what the feedback would be. And then the, I think the other biggest piece was just the overall defensiveness that she had, um, you know, the fact that she, you know, I, I watched the Osborne series and I know that like <laughs> she in general just cusses a lot, but uh, you know, bringing to the conversation, you know, those really intense and kind of aggressive reactions to the point where she's cussing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you can see in terms of the, the tones between the two, as uh, Sharon became more aggressive, it forced um, the co-host um, to kind of take a more like, you know, I'm not accusing you. I'm, um, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing from my, my perspective. She had to take a very different tone in a non-aggressive tone because Sharon had occupied that aggression. So very interesting. Any other uh, observations about this? Could I go next? Would that be okay? Yes, please do. Yeah, thanks. Uh, um, what I noticed was just going along the lines of Bella, a lot of recentering, which I noticed that happens a lot when, uh, at least in my own experience, when uh, we are talking about these very difficult topics. Uh, and when I'm talking about this topic with wide-bodied individuals, I do notice a lot of recentering being they either start crying or they start getting defensive because they say they're a good person, they're not a bad person, they're not racist. So then we're not talking about the topic anymore. What mattered? Now we're talking about the feelings of the other person is when, what's coming up for them and my topic is forgotten so now everybody's attention is on the wide body person which is mainly the point that I, I, I'm trying or some of us are trying to make okay very yeah very astute observations thank you for pointing those out Okay, any, any other, I'm, I'm also looking at the chat too um, and I'm seeing some really great comments on there about, um, about how, how that looks like, um, the white fragility. And just to add something really quick, Cynthia. Sure. So I know the question was sort of more focused on Sharon Osborne, but I want to lift up the behavior that Cheryl Underwood was displaying, which mm -hmm. was, often the responsibility of people of color is to sort of manage um, mm -hmm. the white behavior that comes with racism, right? We yeah. often have to uh, take the higher road or we often have to play the educator or um, 
we have to display more calmness because when we don't and we show anger and we start to get really passionate, that's when we become then the aggressor. And so I want to just highlight Cheryl Underwood's behavior in that because I know it probably took everything in her not to absolutely go off on Sharon Osbourne, not to mention that this is a national syndicated show, that this is her career, this is her bread and butter. And although her, her race was being attacked by someone else that was a colleague in the same space, that um, we often as people of color have to maintain our um, calmness and suppress how we really feel because we often are the aggressor. And so I, I know that we were kind of focused on Sharon's white fragility in that film, but I also just wanted to lift up uh, Cheryl Underwood's behavior. Yes, thank you so much um, for pointing that out, um, um, Melissa, in, in the chat. We've got a like 10, like hella yeah, uh, responses to that because um, that is true and, and just, I don't need to add anything to what you said. That is all true what you said. So thank you for sharing that and pointing that out from her, from perspective of Cheryl. And I think I see um, other hands, Kavika. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I was gonna say, Melissa just said it perfectly, very, very perfectly. That's, that's what I recognized. And that is, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a balance, right? So people of color, they're, they're in a situation where they're, they either have the influence of managing and shaping the conversation, or it could go the other way where they are often pigeonholed and stereotyped to be, again, the mad brown person. Mm -hmm. Again, the mad brown person is coming out, oh, look at the mad brown person. And so we have to try extra hard and be intentional around uh, moving away from that that stereotype that that we're often pigeonholed in that area to be able to be calm and, and peaceful and passive in the way we communicate. But heck yeah, hell yeah, we're angry, but we can't share it because then we find ourselves in the same place of, oh, there they go again. Uh, just what I thought about these people, right? Just what I thought. And so it's a very, very difficult situation. I think Cheryl did a fine job, whatever her name was, um, yeah. uh, the, the co-host, Cheryl, right? She did a fine job and, and, and Melissa's right. We have to work extra hard to maintain peace and calmness. And when we speak to others, to make sure that they don't see us as the aggressor, <laughs> as the aggressive one, right? And so that's all I, I, that, yeah, Melissa said it perfectly. Thank you. That's all. Hey, um, thank you for everyone for um, for your participation in this. Um, um, just and I'm really blown away with the, the kind of discussions that are happening both um, on screen and off screen. And um, please, please continue to interact with us. Um, at this point, we're gonna transition to um, Cameron and he has some really great stuff for us. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share so that Cameron, you can continue yours. So in this, in this portion of the presentation, um, I'd like to talk about how race and oppression impacts us as Pacific Islanders. And, in, in doing so, I hope this is okay. Um, I know this isn't maybe a, as a comment of a discussion in these types of presentations, but I want to share a, a personal story that I think um, serves as a, um, a powerful metaphor um, in regards to Pacific Island health. And it's just a personal experience. And I, and I also feel like in regards to Hawaiian epistemology, we can't talk about us as a people without um, coming back to Aina or land. And so I want to just kind of make that connection. Um, so prior to coming to graduate school, I worked for the University of Hawaii. Um, it was just a small campus on the west side of the Big Island, a town called Kona. Um, and there was a new campus built there and it was carved out um, into this new area on, this, on the lower slopes of Hualalai. And this area we refer to as Pa Lama Nui. Um, pa refers to like an area or a yard um, or it could also refer to a fence. And Lama refers to the trees, um, the trees that were in that area. And so if you look at the slide, I provided some pictures of these Lama trees. And Nui just means many, right? And so, or big. So is this enclosure um, or, or Kipuka, this safe space where there were all these Lama trees. And 
Some of you who've been to the Big Island, you may, um, you may remember this when you were there. If you go to the west side, it doesn't look anything like what you think Hawaii, Hawaii looks like. Um, there's no waterfalls, it's not super green. In fact, what you see is this endless carpet of fountain grass. And if you look down at this, this picture on the bottom right, you'll see this picture of, um, of this grass as well as on the left. And this, this grass is this invasive grass that was brought through um, a ranch in North Kona. I believe it's originally from Africa and it just carpets everything as far as the eye can see. And this grass is the greatest invasive plant threat to the lowland forests. And what's interesting about this grass is it's fire prone and fire adapted, meaning you can burn the grass and then it grows back faster. Fire actually helps it grow. And it, it basically chokes out the rest of the forest. And, and in this area amongst, um, amongst this grass were just these um, last remaining llama trees. Excuse me. And uh, these uh, these llama trees were um, originally part of the native dryland forest there, and uh, um, to put that into perspective. Um, when it comes to the native dryland forest, about 95% uh, of that forest is gone. Um, and, and these trees are some of the oldest and uh, longest living trees um, of their kind. And in, in ancient times, um, my ancestors um, would use these trees to um, build hale or enclosures to treat the sick um, and build fences around sacred places. And, and so for, for us, these trees were um, the makua of the area, the parents of this area, they're the kapuna, yeah? And so um, as Hawaiians working in this area, of course, we got to do our part, yeah? We got a malama, yeah? So, what we would do is we go out and work the land. Um, you can see in this picture, um, here's some picture of us. And what we were doing is we we're removing this fountain grass. Um, and we we're doing this so that the trees could have water because this grass is so compact that it's literally like right up next to these trees. It's, it's like trying to choke them to death. And when it rains, the trees can't get water. And so we would be pulling all this fountain grass. And while we were there, the kumus would be us and they'd be teaching us about these trees. And you could feel the mana of these trees. Um, and, and as we were working, oftentimes we would wonder um, how much these trees had seen because they were there when the forest was there. They were there um, when our ancestors were there. And uh, <coughs> you could feel, <coughs> excuse me, you could feel the kaumaha, we say in Hawaiian, um, or that heavy grief, yeah, from the loss. Um, and also the hope that they would live on. <clears throat> and these trees, the way that they kill the forest is when there's fires, what they do is they take up any space um, that's, that's left for any plants to grow because they grow so fast. And so there's just literally no place for the native plants to even be. And so, um, yeah, these, like I said before, these, these trees were the last remnants of the forest. And there's so much, we had to work so hard to keep this area alive, and um, let alone make it thrive, yeah, to make it come back. And so I remember walking out of my office one day, and um, the way the door faced is when you walk out, you just see the expanse of fountain grass, and then you see the last remaining trees. And I remember thinking when I walked out, 
um, I, ha I had this feeling where I was like, wow, you know, these, this, the experience of these trees is, is similar to um, the experience uh, of us as Native Hawaiians, but also uh, of us as Pacific Islanders, in that um, many ways, we're the last remnants of our people. And at times, uh, it, uh, it feels like we're suffocating through the change that's happened. Um, and the, the question I asked myself in that moment is, I wonder what we need to do to thrive. What, what do these trees need to thrive? Um, and, and I bring this up because that's, that's, the, that's, that's, a, that's the, the same experience of these trees is the experience of us as Pacific Islanders in our homelands. Um, and there are many factors, both historical and contemporary, that are forcing changes in our lands and for us as Polynesians. And if we aren't careful, we can lose aspects um, of what we once were as people and once we, what we once had. And so I want to ask a reflecting question, because in order to understand oppression in Pacific Islander communities, you have to look to our histories. You, you cannot ignore that. Um, and you have to identify the losses that our people have experienced on a collective level. And so I want you to ask yourself this question. When you think of losses experienced by Pacific Islanders, what examples come to mind? This could be related to your own ethnic background, your own experiences. Um, or things you learned or read about if you're not if you're not from Pacific Island ancestry. These could be things related to culture, land, ocean. It could be resource based, spiritual, things related to people or family. So I'm going to give you just a few seconds to think about that. The literature that focuses on our histories, as well as our health, have identified a number of events that have been shared across the Pacific that have been particularly impactful in a negative way. And I'm gonna go through these and provide some brief examples. Um, the number one, the loss of life due to, to, um, due to disease. Uh, Pacific Islanders experienced multiple waves of epidemics, including typhoid, influenza, smallpox, and other diseases. And these have been documented across the Pacific, including Aotearoa, Hawaii, Rapa, the Marquesas, Tahiti, the Cook Islands, Tonga, Samoa, and Fiji. Um, in these cases, the populations were reduced by between 50 to 90% as we had no immunity. In fact, some cases, the loss was so severe that some Pacific Island leaders, as well as Westerners, were concerned that our exposure to disease may lead to our total extinction. Um, two, the devaluation or encouragement of the abandonment of our cultural identities, forced assimilation. This included the encouragement to wear European style clothes to discourage traditional tattooing practices, um, the banning of traditional religions and practices which led to feelings of disconnection from our ancestors, as well as our genders, family, community roles, and the spiritual scaffolding that provided protective social structures for our communities. We also experienced assimilation policies that were aimed at eradicating our cultural identity and traditions. It included laws that prevented us from teaching our native languages and banning traditional medicinal practices. And these, these events were detrimental because they facilitated uh, the loss of cultural knowledge and also told us about our second-class status in our own homelands and inferiority. There's also spiritual abuse. For example, after experiencing these diseases, missionary, missionaries capitalized on these mass traumatic events and attributed um, our loss to, with, from these diseases to our sinful traditional beliefs and would describe our traditional beliefs as both evil and demonic. There are also changes that took place to family structures and gender roles. For example, in Aotearoa, Traditional family values and beliefs encouraged a balance between men and women in the family, 
whose shared primary aim was to provide for their children in a loving and nurturing atmosphere. Extended family members and communities work together in this for this responsibility. However, with the adoption of colonial views, women began to be seen as inferior to men and, and female children were sent to boarding schools to learn how to become domestic and civilized women. There's also negative shifts in parenting styles. <clears throat> um, and many Pacific Island groups adopted disciplinary practices that took place in European run schools and utilized things such as physical abuse and corporal punishment that didn't exist in ancient Polynesia. There's also the taking of land and shifts in political and social structures. Um, for, European, for European settlers in the Pacific, their primary goal is to assimilate Pacific Islanders to a superior civilization that adopted European and Christian expectations and values and take advantage of opportunities for both wealth and power through disintegrating our political authority and redistributing our lands. In many cases, the taking of lands in, involve political influence, legal tactics, the government, the use of religion or outright use of force. We see examples of land being taken throughout Polynesia, including the exploitation in Aotearoa and Hawaii, um, the overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom, Tahiti being colonized by France, and in Samoa, where a portion of the country is now occupied by the US as we know, but has been set to, subjected to colonial rule by a number of European countries in the past. And this is especially devastating as many Pacific Islanders attribute our health to maintaining our relationship with Aina. Seven, the removal of economic and food security because we don't have access to our lands. The imposure of foreign military and economic agendas. And we see this all over the Pacific from the testing of 41 nuclear bombs in Tahiti and 67 by the US in the Marshall Islands, which completely destroyed and poisoned many of the Marshallese lands. And then there's also modern physical displacement and restricted land access. So some people notice that the cost of living has gotten so high in some parts of the Pacific, such as Hawaii, that it may serve as an existential threat for us as Hawaiians, because we're forced to move to the mainland and we can't afford to live in our native lands. And then the likelihood of us marrying other Hawaiians is le much less. And then the parts, parts of the land are always under threat for development tourism. Um, which undermines our gathering rights. Yeah. So what, mo what most people don't realize is yes, these, these experiences are, are deeply saddening, um, but the combination of these events serve as a genocidal experience for Pacific Island groups. And I'd like to quote Ra Raphael Lemkin, who is the person who first coined the term genocide. And this is how he defines it. Generally speaking, genocide does not necessarily mean the immediate destruction of a nation, except when accomplished by mass killing of all members of a nation. It is intended rather to signify a coordinated plan of different actions aiming at the destruction of essential foundations of life of the national groups with the aim of annihilating the groups themselves. The objectives of such a plan would be the disintegration of political and social structures of culture, language, national feelings, religion, um, and the economic existence of the national group, and the destruction of the personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of the individuals belonging to such groups. Um, with that definition, I don't think there's no question that that was our experience. So, in examining the collective losses experienced by us and our ancestors, it's important to identify five forms of oppression that stand out. The first is exploitation. That's the taking advantage of someone else or of a group for one's personal gain. Marginalization, treating the group as insignificant or being denied participation in society or deemed not worthy for society, right? So being unable to vote, which took place in Polynesia or attempting to civilize our ancestors. And then there's powerlessness, um, a group at, as, that has less autonomy or power to influence their own living conditions, not treated with the same level of respect. And that's very evident across all examples. There's also cultural imperialism, which involves the universalization of a dominant group's experience and culture as the norm. Others, as in us, are then expected to assimilate to this culture and the dominant culture heavily defines the lived experiences of the less dominant group. And then lastly, there's violence. And this could be physical or emotional harming. Um, and this is emotional and physical harming based on another group in which they belong, right? 
And these experiences along with these forms of oppression are important for us to point out because when we feel similar forms of oppression that stem from the lingering effect, effects or even mirror these past losses, loss events, we're reminded of the unresolved nature of these events. And that's one way which, in which we as Pacific Islanders and many other groups experience historical trauma. For those of you of Pacific Islanders um, descent, if you took a few seconds, you could identify the specific ways these losses have impacted your own life, the lives of your people, um, and the way that you're reminded of these losses in both your lives, but also in the land and in your communities, right? Examples of these might be not being able to speak your own native language, our overrepresentation in negative societal indices. Um, for me, it's going home and seeing homeless natives, changes to the land, um, and a culturally exploitive economic systems like tourism, right? And this, 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 this feeling, this tension that I'm describing, I, I refer to it again as like the kaumaha. It's that collective sadness that we feel um, or the permanent tension that stems from these events because they're not resolved. They're still, we still face them, yeah. So in discussing these losses, it's also relevant to discuss historical trauma and what historical trauma is and why it's important. Um, historical trauma is made up of three main elements. It's the experience of a significant trauma or wounding. The trauma caused by the event ex is experienced by the whole group, not just individually. And the impact of the trauma spans across multiple generations and does so in a way that causes contemporary generations to experience trauma related symptoms without being present for the original events. Um, and so to define historical trauma, um, what it is, it's that unresolved grief or soul wound characterized by patterns of uh, thought, emotions and behaviors um, that negatively impact the physical, psychological and social well-being of a group. And it's been directly theorized to be linked to health outcomes. So here's a question I pose um, to all of you. Have you ever felt a strong emotional reaction or been exposed to pro prolonged levels of stress or negative emotions to reminders of losses in the past? Have you ever experienced something that makes you feel like these losses are happening again? Have you or your family been impacted by these losses economically, physically, functionally, or culturally? If the answer is yes, then you have experienced historical trauma. Okay. To provide some background, um, historical trauma was first conceptualized by researchers studying survivors of the Jewish Holocaust. And what they found was that their children were actually, actually um, seeking services for uh, mental health for transgenerational transgener symptoms of PTSD that mirrored their parents. And what they, these researchers realized is that the trauma, even though these children didn't go through the Holocaust themselves, that the mental health outcomes of their parents were being transmitted to their children through some form. And in more recent years, um, Maria Yellowhorse, Yellowhorse Braveheart, a Native American scholar out of New Mexico, she adopted this um, concept and applied it to Native Americans. And since then, it's been applied to other people, um, other populations in the field, including the Aboriginal Australians, all of the Pacific, indigenous people of North and South America, Africans, Japanese, and African Americans, um, and again, as us as Pacific Islanders. And if you look at these people's histories, all of them have been victims of historical losses, genocide, oppression, and colonialism. And the way that it's transmitted is through three ways. This is just how it's theorized that it's transmitted. Is one, through direct means, right? Through family stories that provide context to explain the deficits we see in our lives, right? So for example, when I was a kid, I remember asking my tutu after listening to Hawaiian music, I think I was five, tutu, how come we don't speak Hawaiian? And then her explaining that to me and then wondering why they would do that to us, yeah? The second is the indirect. These are societal conditions that impact family functioning, which serve to re-traumatize individuals. These include poor parenting, societal conditions that promote poverty or second-class status. Um, poor educational attainment, exposure to crime, violence, which when combined create cycles of adversity passed down from one generation to the next. And then lastly, there's research that suggests that there may be a genetic link. Um, there's some evidence that exposure to trauma can be imprinted in our genetics and then passed down 
to subsequent generations. There's still a debate in the literature to the extent that this takes place in people, but there's been consistent finding in the testing of animals in that when one parent uh, that was experienced trauma, trauma, they track those gen genetic markers to subsequent generations. And so what we know is that exposure to trauma can change how our bodies re respond to stress, brain functioning, as well as the distribution of the effects of certain chemicals and hormones in our bodies that lead us to be more vulnerable to physical and emotional ailments. Um, additionally, people who have come from populations who have a history of mass trauma are also more vulnerable to negative health outcomes across generations, which is when we, when we, need, when we, under, when we attempt to understand the factors that influence our health disparities, we can't overlook this. And on this slide, these are just some of the examples um, amongst many of symptoms that many people experience who come from populations who experience historical trauma. In this slide, I've created a model that attempts to illustrate the ways in which mass trauma impacts our health outcomes for people across generations. And in this model, there are six phases we will just briefly go over, okay? So in phase one, there's the mass trauma events, right? These are the collective losses that have led to the disruption of the family unit and community on a collective level, right? And it's important to point that out because when you disrupt the family and you disrupt community, especially for us as Polynesians, we know how important family and community is. You eliminate many of our traditional coping strategies and protective barriers, okay? And then you also create significant amounts of stress, which is what's documented in phase two. These, these disruptive events can promote certain family and community conditions that make it difficult for people to thrive, right? When you get taken off your land, no matter how, how hard you work, it's gonna be harder. You're probably experiencing some poverty, right? And so for example, when it comes to poverty, what, what happens in the family unit when poverty is there? You have a poorer diet, less family time, less money for education, less adequate housing, increased parental stress, which leads to poor parenting outcomes. This also leads to higher risk of adverse childhood experiences, such as abuse, neglect, parents with mental illness. And then we also know the biological effects that I just summarized of trauma and how that can impact our bodies and ability to respond to these stressors. And then on top of all of that, there's the assimilation pressure that we're navigating all these things when we're encouraged to abandon who we are, right? And what this leads to is social, cognitive, and emotional impairment, right? Those are conditions such as depression, anger, internalized inferiority from the devaluation that we feel, the disruption of community. And when dealing with these, with these things, when we don't have effective coping mechanisms or the means to get treatment, we often adopt high-risk behaviors. And these are often to either supplement things we don't have, such as gang affiliation due to a lack of family or community, or drug use to cope through the pain and substance abuse, right? And the combination of these poor living conditions as well as high rates of stress and exposure to life adversities, in addition to the adoption of high-risk behaviors then puts our people at greater risk for developing physical health problems and then experiencing early death, right? And, and, and it's not hard to, I don't have to explain how this affects people across generations and is perpetuated, right? And so in this, in this clip, I want to share um, a clip that highlights how these losses have impacted Pacific Islanders in modern times, as well as ways in which white cultural supremacy and fragility need to be addressed in order for us to heal. We haven't moved on since the arrival of Cook. Can you guys hear that? We're still colonizing. We're still not partners. We still don't include. I'm not proud to say I'm a recovering racist. Of course I'm not. I have to live with that for the rest of my life. But it's the truth. I'd opened a new business, an optometry practice. We'd won a Top Shop Award for retail. Very exciting night. And the then mayor came up to me at the end and said, congratulations. I want you to... Um, Put your name in the hat for the next election, because one day I think you could be our mayor. Oh, yeah, I mean, it ticked all the ego boxes. I'd never considered politics ever in my life. So it worked, and I applied to become on a council. Turns out he says that to everybody. 
my campaign slogan was, let's bring honesty back to local politics. I never thought those words would come to me in a way that I couldn't have predicted in terms of what actually ultimately unfolded. My first official engagement within the Māori world, such as the Mayor, was to visit Owaimarai and Waitara for Sir Maui Pomari Day. I was so anxious, I, I mean I couldn't sleep the night before, I was learning a bit of a pepihara to do because I had to speak. The thing is, I didn't know how to go on a marae. Where do I look? What do I do? I haven't honged anyone in the past. Am I, well, how do I do that? Do I do that? Um, what does that mean? What am I going to eat? What, what is for lunch? What do they eat? I mean, it's ridiculous. The thing is, it was lovely. It was, what was I scared of? Man, I was asking myself some deep probing inner questions around my ignorance. Why have I never been in this world? Why have I never looked? The nagging thought in my mind and heart was, were well, you racist, Andrew? And of course I default to no, well, no, I'm not. Well, how do you know you're not? Because New Zealand is Pākehā. We don't really talk about it. I started reading some backstories of my own province, and it was like reading two parallel universes. All the horrendous statistics that Māori are in, in health, education, poverty, homelessness, the disproportionate incarceration rates. And I thought, you know what? That's through policies that Europeans have created. So those outcomes for Māori are actually at the hand of us. We're the problem. In New Zealand, all councils, every six years, have what's known as a representation review. And the essence of that is a council should reflect fair representation of its people. In this process, the first question a council must ask is should it decide to vote to establish a seat for Māori? Just as we can have rural seats, we understand those, and urban city seats. And we think, well, that's fair enough. The farming people have their own world challenges, their own st lifestyle and culture. We, they need to be there, otherwise the townies will dictate the outcomes. We will get that. The same applies for Māori because Māori deserve to have their voice at the table. But here's the kicker. Only that seat has the legal ability to be petitioned and removed by way of polling and public referendum. Not the rural seat, not the general seat or the city seats, only the Māori seat. So our council voted to establish the Māori ward in its representation review. It was so divisive. There was an outcry in the community to form a petition to enforce a referendum that binds that council to that outcome for the next six year period. They got it in record time. Businesses advertising where the place to sign the petition. A councillor saying come to my place to sign the petition. The petition was presented to me at council. When the result from the polling came to the office, I could tell by the look on their faces what the answer was. I can't even remember the numbers other than just hearing we're sorry. I found myself driving and then ending up here at Lucy's Gully. I just needed to find some space, find some way to just absorb what my community had said. What I was witnessing was the tokenism around it all. Because there was 15 people on my council it was one seat for Māori. I have had a petition to Parliament, been sitting with them for a year and a half, saying surely the fairest way is that any seat that a council establishes should follow the same process. Either they can all be petitioned or none. Or be honest enough to say you don't actually want Māori there in a real way. In my time in the office, I was inundated with hate mail and things. It was an event that I put on for JPs. I did a small karakia welcome. Five of them came up to me at the end and goes, aren't you the right little Mary boy? His mate says, that's right son, don't think we've not been following you with all this Mary stuff around the table, you're not coming back. But you represent the justice system. This is horrible stuff. I'd just never seen it. So what I was experiencing is nothing for what Māori have to live with. Some people might think, well I'm not racist, I done a te reo course, I sympathise, because people have said that to me, so then I said, that's great. 
Did you agree we should have a Māori seat at the table? Yeah, no, they should have a seat at the table. There's 15 councillors, should it be seven each? Seven each? That's getting a bit carried away. Why not? It's a partnership. No, no, that's, that's just ridiculous. Is that racism? We have to challenge each other. Help break down those barriers and those systems that have done all this. Lobby your MP to remove legislation that allows us to petition Māori. Lobby your MP to have a better justice system, health and education system. Support the return of what was taken. We're all in this. You don't have to be elected to make a difference. You've got to stand up to racism. You just do. So we have just a few minutes left. Um, and so I'm gonna go over these slides quickly because I wanna leave some time for question and answers. And we're gonna skip this poll um, just for the sake of time, but just a question to reflect on when, and this is specifically regards to race. When asked to identify yourself by race, do you feel represented by the AAPI terminology, Asian American and Pacific Islander terminology? And, and the reason why I, I bring this up is because um, to this day, us as Polynesians are still categorized in many ways using the AAPI terminology in which we're categorized with Asian Americans. Um, however, we obviously know we come from a different part of the world, a different region of the world, um, and that our contextual factors, our factors related to um, us as people are different from Asian Americans. And so the problem with this is that when well, I guess the danger in this really is that when our data is combined with Asian Americans, we become invisible in the health world. And it's because our population is so much smaller and we can't address our unique health needs on a large scale if we're unaware of what they are, right? And the research shows that we clearly have distinct health needs and that there's also a wide variety of health disparities that we face um, uniquely as Pacific Islanders. And so I'm just going to flash a couple slides that just show some of these statistics for the sake of time. The first is um, statistics related to our health. We generally have a lower health uh, or life expectancy and pass away at younger ages than other ethnic groups. We experience higher rates of cancer, diabetes, and other ailments. Two, we also have, tend to have worse mental health outcomes and, high, and higher rates of mental illness that differ than Asian Americans, right? So for example, when it comes to suicide in the data that's available, all Pacific Islander populations tend to have higher suicide rates compared to non-Pacific Islander populations with the highest rates among males between 15 and 24. And in some cases, the rates are as high as seven times the national average for some of our people. We also experience mental health differently one study found that we use different words to describe depression. We say anger instead of hopelessness or sadness. And then there's contextual factors, right? We are, some of our people tend to experience greater levels of poverty, higher levels of drug use, and then less educational opportunities, right? And the purpose of this isn't of sharing these statistics isn't to highlight ways we are struggling, but to highlight the important need to separate our data from the AAPI lab, label. And that's one way race impacts us as a people in that we aren't represented, right? And even though some places use the term Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander, that it's not consistent. And, and we need consistency for our people. So the question is, with this information we provide today, where do we go from here? We all have a responsibility to recognize and combat social and systemic barriers that oppress not only us, but all groups of people. We need to combat white fragility so we can keep conversations going. We can't ignore these things. We also need to remember that fragility can exist in any social setting where there's a difference in, of power and privilege. That could be in regards to gender, gender sexual orientation um, or religion. And we can't have progress without being able to address race-based issues and historical losses from the past that still affect us now. And so I hope you enjoyed our presentation today. Um, when I think of the term aloha in, in um, Hawaii, it's a reciprocal relationship. And in our relationship, we um, give gifts and then people use those gifts um, 
also provide gifts. And so today our gift to you is this um, mana'o, um, this ike. And I hope that the gift you give back to us is making a difference um, for people in your lives. So I want to uh, thank Cynthia and Cameron for their wonderful presentation on white fragility. And now I just wanna open it up. We have a few minutes here for some questions and answer. Um, so you can either just unmute or ask the question in the chat and I'll go ahead and um, ask it to the group. I, I have a question, if I may. Uh, with, thank, first of all, thank you so much for this amazing presentation. Uh, it was the combination of feeling triggered and feeling hopeful and feeling, um, it was just a buffet of emotions. So thank you so much. And based on that, I wanted to just uh, hear it, how do you take care of yourself? Uh, how, <clears throat> because I can, I, um, I won't lie and say we have identical experiences, but I do empathize. Um, I have gone through similar experiences at times and it's important for me to take care of myself. So I continue to do this important work. So I would like to hear some ideas of how do you take care of yourself and be there for your family and your community? Um, I guess I could answer that one. Um... And, and maybe this is coming, like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a therapist, so maybe this is too much of like a therapeutic answer, but I, I once heard a quote by um, Billy Kenoy. He said, you cannot grow up Hawaiian and know your history and not be mad. Um, so sometimes I create space for me to be mad <laughs> and just let it out. Um, I, also, I also say um, I'm in Utah now, um, but I try to make space to go back home and reconnect, um, take off my shoes, Walk on the walk on the sand, um, reconnect to Aina, engage in the culture where I can. Um, yeah, and I, I think that's rejuvenating for me. Thank you so much. Like almost transferring your body to where it, where it feels at home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, did you want to add quickly to that? Um, yeah, I, I think that I live in Utah as well, but, um, you know, there's, there's always the saying, like, you can't take the girl from the island, um, can take the girl from the island, I can't take the island from the girl, um, but um, what I, I, I like to think about is, is kind of like the, the gifts that I'm learning on the mainland and, and being, um, you know, associated in academia here, um, I always think about going back home and how to give back and how to contribute to um, the populations that I feel like very close to um, with family being like, um, I've had, you know, my, my dad is actually back in the islands. Uh, he struggled with homelessness and incarceration. And, um, and so those things never leave. I think that, um, you know, um, I always feel like an urge to go to go back, it's so expensive though. One of the things Cameron talked about, but they've they've never left me. Like the islands have never left me. And um, I think just acquiring as many gifts here as possible and as connections and and um, and networking and then using those powers to, you know, the superpowers to, to give back to um, the islands. And so, see, this is like, I, I feel sad every time um, winter comes here in Utah and I, um, always threatened to move back to the islands, but um, I always want to go back with my suitcase full of, of things to contribute back to our communities. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Martha, for the question. Lori, I believe you had a question. I do. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Um, my question stems from a statement that Cameron said that in the, the terminology is anger, I think mm -hmm. is what you said, is I feel angry. Um, do you sense that that is still the case for those that live um, in US or Canada or just not on the island? Or do you feel like, um, I don't know, I just have a question about that. Do, they, do you still feel that way even if you were born here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or raised here? You know, I think, I think that's a good question. Um, and, and I don't want to speak for everyone, um, but I would say that we're, we all, as Pacific Islanders, we all have connection to our homelands. Um, one that's more that, than just 
regards to place, but a spiritual connection. We have connection to our ancestors. Um, and maybe when we're in the mainland, we don't see it as much in regards to like the colonization piece um, that I was referring to. But I don't think we can escape the feelings when we are immersed in it. Um, we're still connected as people and we're still connected to Aina. Aina is part of our Ohana. And so, um, yeah, maybe it varies for different people. Um, and we're hoping to do some research on that. But um, yeah, I, I, I think that we're all sensitive to those events that have impacted us for sure. So, and, in, and if I understood you right, it was in reference to feeling depressed. Yeah, it's the, collect, it's the collective tension we all feel because of these losses and that they haven't been resolved. And a lot, some Hawaiian scholars have theorized that this may be one of the sources in which why, at least for Native Hawaiians, um, our rates of depression are higher, but this might also reflect in other groups, but it just hasn't been tested empirically. All right, thank you. Thank you, Laurie. I think we have another question, Rebecca, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. So my question is, how do you think that we can go about um, breaking down the, the walls of uh, the typical or stereotypical Polynesian um, Pacific Islander toughness? And I think that this kind of crosses uh, more than just the, you know, the Pacific Islanders, it's Native American, Hispanic, we all have that tough, macho, um, personality, but in working with Polynesian kids um, in specific, they have a much more of a, a bigger wall, a tougher wall, and it's hard to break that down. Um, what do you think about that? What are your suggestions on working with that and helping everybody come together rather than keep those walls uh, built up? Well, I, I think about um, what what mana like what mana means and um i'd like to just kind of point out um you know cameron cameron showed extreme um mana in our in our presentation um through through vulnerability and um through you know sharing his emotions about how he feels about um about this um where we've we've come from as as people and what we continue to struggle with and um, I think like showing different diff like giving that example right that's that 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 strength is not always aggression that strength strength is openness strength is education strength is vulnerability and just um, being able to model those those different um, those different traits as also things that are um, considered mana so um, yeah Cameron I don't know Cameron do you want to add to that. Yeah, no, I would say the same thing. And I've actually read some studies where that um, the more open expression of emotion was more commonplace traditionally. Um, and, and I think we need to get back there. And I think we need to model that in our families and model that at church and model that um, at school. And I think that's one of the ways you build relationships with people. And we know as Pacific Islanders how important that is when it comes to relationships, yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there are any other questions. I don't see any other hands. Oh, Lillian, Lillian, please unmute. Just thank you, Cameron, for sharing. And um, I think that, you know, I, um, I did, I used to work for the police department and I gathered data for the attorney general's office on violence against women. And I connected the, um, the um, calls to domestic violence to suicide, which was something that they didn't connect in the past, but, um, and then the rate of incarceration of, uh, so, you know, in, uh, on Hawaii Island, where people have been locked down for 22 hours because of the COVID virus and have not seen families since March of last year. Um, I'm, you know, at one point it was, Trying to, trying to figure out how to penetrate a systemic uh, assault that is biased. Um, and it was to begin to learn their language. How can I express myself using their words? And, but even with that, um, I think that color 
is apparent, even in sharing, um, you know, even in expressing and introducing policy, um, you know, it depends who you're going up against, but color is still apparent um, for, uh, for, for Pacific Islanders. There's something that, and maybe it's because of the, you know, uh, so we have our um, Moana and, and, um, and Maui's got all his tattoos, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, so we define uh, Polynesian or Pacific Islander men as these, you know, macho, and they really aren't. They're very um, kind and um, loving and, um, you know, in, in family settings. And that, that's been my experience. I, I experienced it when I went to New Zealand as well. Um, and then the women are exotic, uh, you know, the, you know, uh, media uh, promoted women as the exotic uh, Pacific Islander woman who would be a servant or, you know, and so, uh, and I've experienced, I mean, I was, anyway, but I think, I guess language is the way to, uh, is, is being mindful about our language and, and choosing it wisely to share the experience um, as a way to hopefully uh, change the system. I guess that wasn't a question, <laughs> I'm sorry. Just sharing. Thanks, Cameron and Cynthia. Yeah, no, thank you, Auntie. Okay. Um, so I I want to thank uh, Cynthia and Cameron for their presentation um, and discipline to be able to share some very deepening um, and heartfelt. Um, information with all of us today that I hope can benefit the work that all of you do.